A-level biology contains a lot of skills, but it also contains a huge number of new facts for you to learn and memorise. This video covers the first part of Unit 6 for OCR A-level biology A, which, if you have the most common textbook, is equivalent to Chapter 19. This is a summary of some purely factual recall questions that I've put together that you can use a bit like flashcards. There's a link in the description below to a document that has all the questions in it so that you can have a go at answering them and then use this video to check that your answers are right. We start with some definitions that you're probably familiar with from GCSE. So a gene is a length of DNA that codes for one particular protein. An allele is one of several different variants of that gene, which is caused by mutation. A mutation is a change in the sequence of the DNA, and if it's a spontaneous mutation, that means that it's one that's happened during cell division. A mutagen is something that increases the likelihood of mutation occurring. There aren't specific named examples of biological, chemical and physical mutagens, but it's a good idea to have a few up your sleeve. So the most obvious kind of biological mutagen would be a virus like HPV, but there are also base analogues and alkylating agents like mustard gas. Then in terms of chemical mutagens, you can think about your clastogens like benzene and deaminating agents. And physical mutagens might include all of your electromagnetic spectrum, so UV light and X-rays and gamma rays. Classifying mutations can get a little bit confusing because we can classify them into different groups depending on whether we're looking at the DNA sequence or the protein sequence or the protein activity or finally the phenotype. So question seven is asking you about the impact on the phenotype. So therefore, we're going to split our mutations into beneficial ones, which help the organism, neutral ones, which don't have any impact, and deleterious ones, which are actively harmful. There are loads of different examples, particularly for deleterious and neutral mutations. But for beneficial, the most likely one that you're likely to know about is lactose persistence. Although you could also think about things like the mutation that leads the peppered moth to be dark, which would be beneficial if it's living somewhere where you've got dark trees, thinking industrial revolution and that sort of thing. Neutral mutations, well, that's most of them because most of these mutations are going to be silent. And then for deleterious ones, you could go for literally any genetic disease. So cystic fibrosis is just kind of the most obvious one because it was one that was named for you at GCSE. Neutral mutations are going to be the most common of these. The first reason why a mutation may not affect the phenotype of the organism in which it occurs is that the vast majority of the genome is non-coding. So if this mutation occurs in the middle of an intron or in one of the non-coding regions between genes, then it's not going to affect the sequence of the protein unless it's causing some kind of frame shift mutation. The second reason is that the genetic code is redundant or degenerate. And what that means is there are multiple different base codons which code for the same amino acid. So for instance, if you have a codon which is GCC, it doesn't matter if that final C is changed to an A or a G or a T because all four of those codons all code for alanine. So it's not actually going to change the sequence of the protein even though it's changed the sequence of the DNA. And then finally, it may be possible that the sequence of the protein has been changed, but if that particular amino acid is at a place that it's not involved in the folding of the protein, then you may still have a fully functional protein that doesn't have any impact on the phenotype. A point mutation refers to the change in a single base or maybe just a couple of bases, whereas a chromosome mutation involves a substantial proportion of the chromosome. The four kinds of chromosome mutation are deletion, duplication, translocation and inversion. Point mutations may be deletions, insertions or substitutions. If you're inserting three bases, then it's going to have less of an impact on the protein because it's not going to cause a frame shift mutation. And what that means is that all of the downstream amino acids are still going to be coded for correctly. You're just going to have one extra amino acid inserted. If we classify mutations based on their impact on the protein sequence, then we can talk about them being silent, so they don't impact it. They could be nonsense if they lead to a short version of the protein because they're adding a premature stop codon, or they could be missense if they're adding in an alternative amino acid instead. So as we've just said, silent means that there's no impact on the protein sequence. Nonsense means that we've got the short version of the protein being produced, and missense is an alternative amino acid being inserted. If we talk about um, a codon being degenerate or redundant, this is this idea that there's more than one triplet codon that codes for the same amino acid. 
If a missense mutation is conservative, that means that the original amino acid has been replaced by an amino acid of the same type. So a polar one replaced by a polar one, or a positively charged one replaced by a positively charged one. Whereas non-conservative is where we've got a different class of amino acids, so maybe a non-polar amino acid being replaced by a negatively charged amino acid. If we're going to classify our mutations based on protein activity, then they can be amorph, which means that we've lost the function, hypomorph, which means the function has been reduced, or hypermorph, which means that we have a gain of function mutation. Gene expression needs to be controlled because all of your cells have the same DNA, but they're not all making the same proteins, so we need some way of determining which proteins need to be expressed. Also, even within an individual cell, it may be necessary to upregulate or downregulate certain genes in response to changes in the environment. Transcription is the process where we take that DNA and we copy it onto a molecule of mRNA in order to be able to have that leave the nucleus and go on to make a protein. A promoter region is a DNA sequence that tends to sit just upstream of the gene and proteins bind to that in order to initiate transcription. Heterochromatin is made of these tightly bound packets of DNA where we've got chromatin wound around histones to make nucleosomes. And kind of the point of it is that it's transcriptionally inactive. So this happens during and in preparation for cell replication. And the reason that we're doing it is to stop the DNA from being transcribed during cell replication because there's just too much risk that something is going to go wrong. During interphase, the DNA isn't in the form of heterochromatin, instead it's in the form of euchromatin. Adding acetyl groups increases the rate of transcription, and it does this by reducing the positive charge of the histones, and that's going to mean that the DNA coils less tightly around them, so it's easier for these transcriptional enzymes and proteins to get involved. In order to reduce the transcription of DNA, we add methyl groups, and this has an impact because it increases the hydrophobia, and that makes the DNA coil more tightly around the histones, so it stops those transcriptional proteins from being able to get in. Transcription factors are proteins that regulate the transcription of genes, and the two types are activators and repressors. An inhibitor region is a regulatory region of DNA and it's controlling transcription and if it's bound to then it prevents transcription from happening. An operon is a section where we've got multiple genes on one chromosome and they're all under the control of one promoter region. So that means that they're all going to be transcribed together, they're never going to be individually transcribed. And it's useful to have these operons if we've got certain genes that are always all expressed at the same time. So, for instance, the classic example is the LAC operon, and that's only going to be expressed when you have that lactose available and glucose not available. And in that situation, you're always going to need all three of those genes to be expressed. The LAC operon is going to be made of the LAC I or LAC inhibitor gene, followed by the operator, the promoter, and then those three structural genes, which are LAC Z, LAC Y and LAC A. The genes in the LAC operon are expressed when there is lactose available, but glucose is in short supply. And normally they're not going to be expressed because there's a repressor protein which is bound to the operator and that stops RNA polymerase from accessing the promoter region. When lactose is available, this inhibits the repressor protein, so it unbinds and that makes the promoter available so RNA polymerase can bind. Cyclic AMP is made out of ATP and it's used to control gene expression. The way it works is that it forms a complex with CAMP receptor protein or CRP and that binds to the DNA increasing the expression of these genes. Within a gene the introns are the non-coding regions which sit between the exons which are the coding regions which actually give us the sequence for the polypeptide. In order to turn pre-mRNA into mature mRNA, firstly, those introns need to be spliced out, and secondly, we need to add a poly-A tail and a 5 pry cap. The reason for doing these is that having the poly-A tail and the 5 pry cap is going to prevent the RNA from being degraded by enzymes called RNases, which are there to sort of stop viral RNA from being able to hang around in the cell undetected. Alternative splicing is when we take one original mRNA molecule and depending on the particular protein or polypeptide that we want to make, we remove different combinations of introns. So the idea of doing this is that you can have one gene which can give rise to several different proteins. 
adding that poly A tail and five pry cap so that we prevent the degradation of mRNA is one way that we can change the protein expression at the translation stage. But also we can have the binding of inhibitory proteins and we can activate initiation factors. Post-translation, it's also possible to alter the activity of a particular protein by adding non-protein groups. So that could be lipids or phosphates or also carbohydrate chains. Also by modifying amino acids, which may lead to different changes in bonding and therefore the shape of the protein, and also by modification by cyclic AMP. When an embryo is developing and one body part erroneously develops as a different body part, so for instance where you've got those pictures of fruit flies and they've got extra legs coming out of their head instead of antennae, that's homeosis. A homeobox gene is this really highly conserved transcription factor gene, which is always 180 base pairs long. And it codes for this 60 amino acid transcription factor. When we say that it's really highly conserved, what we mean is that the base sequence hasn't changed for millions and millions of years. So even organisms that are not closely related from an evolutionary point of view still have the exact same sequence. The reason that these genes are so highly conserved is basically because if they weren't, everything would die. So the working homeobox protein is absolutely vital for survival. So if there is any kind of mutation, then the mutants don't survive. And therefore, a mutated version of the gene is not passed on to any offspring. Fox genes are a subset of homeobox genes that are only found in animals. So all Hox genes are homeobox genes, but not all homeobox genes are Hox genes. Only animals have Hox genes. Morphogenesis is just the proper name for the development of an organism. And we're talking here about the polarity of the organism, but also the symmetry and the number and location of any appendages. So that's legs and arms and antennae. When an embryo is developing, we're going to see both mitosis and apoptosis. So the mitosis is necessary because that's how we're going to make the new cell tissue by cell division. And then apoptosis or cell death is how we're going to shape the organs by selective die off. A bleb is a bulge of the plasma membrane that starts to form at the start of apoptosis. And once that's been broken down and we've got um, cell death happening, then the cell fragments are absorbed by phagocytosis. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you found that a useful addition to your A-level biology revision. If you did find this video useful then don't forget to check out the rest of the channel and like and subscribe for more A-level biology videos coming soon.